This is the first webinar of this year's event series, City We Begins, at the UBC Hong Kong Studies Initiative. Our goal of this year is to encourage reflections on the new normal and its implications for communities in Hong Kong, Canada, and beyond through academic discussion and research. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Samson Yoon as our speaker. Dr. Samson Yoon is an associate professor in the Department of Government and International Studies at Hong Kong Baptist University. He is a political scientist who researches contagious politics, civil conflicts, public opinion, how food and politics, focusing particularly on East Asia. He holds a D-field in politics from Oxford University. The title of today's talk is Becoming Communities, the Changing Phase of Community Activism in Hong Kong. A Q&A session will follow. Please feel free to type in your questions or comments in the chat box anytime, and we'll try our best to go through them after Dr. Yoon's talk. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to Dr. Yoon. My presentation is, uh... Originally, I named it as a Building Communities, the Changing Face of Community Activism in Hong Kong. So, so as the title suggests, I'm going to look at um, community activism. And the reason why I, I, I changed the title uh, is that I, I couldn't really think of how do I describe this, um, th this development of community activism in Hong Kong? How do, we, to, how do I conceptualize it? So originally, I thought, you know, I came up with a more... Um, uh, a modest name, building community, but but then when I think of it, I think this is um the community activism in Hong Kong is actually a process of re trying to reclaim communities from from bottom up. Um, so I, I I chose this very nice uh, um, um, illustration of uh, I don't I'm not sure if anyone I, I see that a lot of from the audience are from Hong Kong, but anyone can recognize where this this community is. Um, this is actually um, uh, from a very recent il illustration from 2017. It's it's actually Toon Moon. It's very nice illustration of Toon Moon, and the um, the book uh, contains a lot of illustration of different districts in Hong Kong. So I, I I chose this because of this very very local flavor. It's a it's a so this is a topic that I've been working on. Um, for actually quite a long time since 2015, but on and off. Um, so the why why do I choose community as my um, as as a subject of study? Um, the the reason is that Hong Kong as as a as a person who grew up in Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong has never really developed a very strong sense of um, community belonging or or community identity. Uh, we 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 don't identify ourselves by where we live within Hong Kong, um, and um, also you know community relationship, uh, neighbor relations has never been really, you know, good. Uh, especially if you live in a gated community in Hong Kong, you rarely talk to uh, the neighbors. Maybe your neighbor, immediate neighbors, but not people you know living in in the community. But in recent years, we there there is a uh, very rapid development in, in this respect. There's increasing interest in um, community affairs. There's a lot of community initiatives, including this one you're seeing, you know, il illustrating Hong Kong's different communities. Um, there are um, a lot of groups um, emerging uh, in, in the grassroots, and there are even people identify themselves increasingly by the communities they live in, and people who um, uh, started newspapers, you know, community newspapers to write about their own community. So I want to reflect about these changes and what is the, you know, driving force of um, of this um, um, uh, this very important development. So as a, as a social movement scholars, I've been always um, very interested in um, things happening on the streets. So it's the street actions, um, the, all the confrontations. Uh, but as I was observing social movements, I um, I also see that you know um, the uh, uh, social movement can also be a, a great force of change, not in terms of the policy level, but in terms of um, um, you know what's happening at the grassroots. So I argue in this presentation that um, social movements uh, is a, is an important force of change 
in in uh, re in or invigorating community activism. Um, and um, so if we think of social movements as uh, earthquakes, okay, shocks, then community activism would be the aftershocks. And so these aftershocks are usually harder to detect, but they are very important uh, developments. They are also, you know, important tectonic activities that that are uh, reshaping uh, our social life. Um, so as we go through this presentation, we'll notice that the community activism, each wave of community activism is shaped by the preceding social movements. And these community activism will also serve as a context or as a basis for, um, for future um, social movements. So let's go back to our um, starting point on um, um, about you know where we come from. Okay, so the idea of community in Hong Kong wasn't something new, um, but it was something imposed from top down from the colonial administration. Uh, it was a, a, a administrative co construct uh, imposed by the um, British colonial administration. So our current boundaries, well, we have 18 districts in Hong Kong uh, nowadays. So the, the current boundaries more or less come uh, originate from the 1960s and more precisely uh, the late 1960s um, when Hong Kong Island was consolidated from 15 districts to uh, four districts. So now we have four districts. Uh, Kowloon from 22 districts into um, six districts and new territories uh, expanded from four districts to five districts. So um, this is more or less, you know, Hong Kong at the moment, you know, 18 districts came uh, approximately from that period. So the purpose of this demarcation was um, basically a very top-down construct by, by the colonial government. It was to facilitate governance, um, especially in light of what's happen what, what happened in 1967, um, with the with the riots and also in 1966 and other riots um another aim was to fulfill uh developmental needs because at that time uh there is a lot of housing demand in hong kong so the government needs to um open up new land um to build public housings so the the new town development for example um requires you know demarcation of new districts especially in the new territories so under this context, districts um, act as a unit of local administrative structures. Okay, so um, and the, so the, the 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 colonial administration introduced the uh, city district officer scheme, Man Zing Zhu Yang Gai Wa, in 1968. So under this scheme, community level would be uh, there will be a three tier system. So on the top, there's this city district. So underneath, um, there will be the area com committees and also the mutual aid committees, which are based on buildings. So these three tier system would 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 co-opt community leaders into it. Okay. Um, the other purpose of districts was to provide uh, welfare services. Um, so uh, through the arms of the urban and regional council. So in Chinese, they are the Xi Jingle and Kuiwek Xi Jingle. Um, provision of services like sports facilities, swimming pools, libraries um, to, um, to the grassroots citizens. The third aim of, um, of districts was to provide uh, some sort of grassroots representation. So other than the co-optation of community leaders, there's also elections, um, especially you know, you know, starting from the 1980s um, with the introduction of the district board, and with the introduction of popular vote in the uh, in 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 the um, urban council and region, uh, urban council as well. Okay, so increasing uh, grassroots representation. So altogether, um, districts or communities um, they serve as a dimension of um, what Ambrose King called the administrative absorption of politics. So it was a, a way for the colonial administration to penetrate its tentacles into the uh, local society um, in order to provide better welfare service for people and to give people um, a certain voice in the, in, in the community. But um, this construction of community is actually quite uh, inorganic um, and 
it, it was to facilitate governance from a top-down perspective. So for example, if we look at um, data right now, okay, uh, if you look at the districts, um, if we compare Yunlong and Samsoibo in Hong Kong, Yunlong is much bigger than Samsoibo, more than 10 times bigger. But Samsoibo has a lot of people. So you, you can see that uh, um, the this is one of the illustration of the fact that districts are not um, they, the, the, the boundaries are drawn in a way that doesn't correspond to, you know, equal representation or equal needs. So uh, the, the communities, in other words, are quite inorganically uh, constructed. But nev nevertheless, we see um, over the years in Hong Kong, so I, um, uh, there has been increasing interest uh, in the idea of community. So uh, I did a search through Wise News uh, using the keyword community in the printed media in Hong Kong. So uh, starting from 1998, so here we see this is a, just an illustration of the uh, uh, you know increasing interest in the word community. Uh, we see some peaks here. The spikes are correspond to, for example, in 03, uh, correspond to major epidemics. Um, oh, you, you can see that 03 and uh, uh, 2020 uh, because of the you know emphasis of the word community as a you know uh, for 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 you know for for immunization or for uh, for treatment. Uh, but, but I haven't really looked into why there are spikes in 07 and 09. But here, what I really what, what I just want to illustrate is a, a basic steady trend of increase in the mention of community. It could mean many things. And if I look further into the data, you'll find it very interestingly that a lot of mention of the word community is actually from state-owned newspapers that like Wenhui Bao and uh, Dai Gong Bo, Man Wei Bao Dai Gong Bo. Uh, and a lot of the mention also correspond not to, you know, not necessarily to how I understand about community, but also how, um, but also basically from the, you know, government perspective uh, about community. But uh, I just want to illustrate the steady trend of increase. So why is that the case? Why is there increasing interest or increasing interest in uh, community affairs? Uh, and, uh, and also the rise of community activism. So I, I argue that social movements play an important role in, uh, in, in driving, in fueling community activism uh, through three waves. So I would describe three waves of community activism in uh, um, the, uh, this presentation. So the first wave uh, was triggered by the anti-colonial movements uh, from six, uh, 56 to 1967. Um, which result in the first wave from 1970 to 1990s. And then the second wave from the, uh, the, the anti-government movements uh, between 2003 and 2005, triggering a wave of community activism uh, a few years later, um, uh, manifesting in, in, in form of heritage preservation uh, and also a series of anti-development uh, movements. The third uh, were the pro-autonomy or pro-democracy movements um, between in 2012 and 2019, which resulted a third wave, which happened pretty much concurrently um, with, with this wave. So um, the, uh, by, by uh, feeling uh, community activism here, I, I don't just mean that community activism happen after those social movements. And there are certainly, I don't just mean that they provide inspiration for people to go to, into the communities. But as we go into this presentation, you'll see that there are diffusion of the actors who were involved in the previous wave of uh, social movement into the, uh, into the subsequent wave of um, community activism. Uh, a diffusion in terms of the actors and also the frames as well as the issue concerns. So they are brought from the previous um, preceding social movements into the subsequent phase of community activism. So let's start with the first phase um, from 1970s to 1990s. Um, the first wave, uh, wave of community activism uh, was um, what was the aftershock of uh, the um, you know, the riots in 66 and 67, I, uh, previous lie, I put it, you know, even uh, further back to 50, 56, the double 10 riots. So these, all these riots, 
basically alerted the colonial governments uh, the importance of um, implementing social reforms. Um, and on the other hand, there is also um, a, a new left-leaning ideological wave um, that influenced the local student activists. Um, um, partly uh, was a legacy of the 60s, um, was a legacy of the riots in the 60s when um, um, you know, people protest against the colonial government um, and with anti-colonial ideologies, but also partly from uh, you know, uh, into intellectual inspiration from uh, Marxist, from uh, or, or other leftist uh, yeah, ideologies. So uh, the local student act and activists, they were um, they they were inspired, and then they were increasingly concerned for the marginalized communities. So that we see this two wave, um, the two um, forces converging. So on the one hand, the government. Um, they were much more, they, 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 they want to penetrate um, more to the grassroots, they want to provide better uh, welfare services to respond to grassroots needs. And on the other hand, there are a group of students and activists bottom, from bottom up trying to um, um, help uh, the, the, the marginalized communities. So the consequences here is um, the government introduced, apart from those um, schemes, you know, the city officer, city, uh, city district officer scheme, the mutual aid community, uh, mutual aid committees, the government also introduced a, a new scheme called the neighborhood level community development project, okay, and C, uh, NLCDP. So social workers would know that because it's a scheme that uh, provide funding for the social workers to provide services to uh, marginalized communities in uh, like squatter, squatter houses or boat dwellers or, uh, you know, uh, um, places that were to be soon demolished. Um, so at the same time, the uh, voluntary associations, so uh, a lot of new voluntary associations were established like SOCO, uh, like, um, you know, YMCA and Caritas has been there, but they, um, they, you know, take government funding to provide, you know, to do community development work, along with the religious organizations as well, okay? And the third um, consequence was the, there were a lot of ad hoc mobilization by, by uh, left-leaning activists, and also the social workers who are in the communities, which I'm about to uh, talk about. But before that, uh, I just want to show you um, this. There is a government evaluation of the NCDLP program. Um, so, um, uh, you know, it, it, it lies in the Hong Kong Records Office, and uh, there is a very thick bunch of documents that talk about that, uh, ha, ha, that, you know, that records how the government evaluates their own program of NCDLP. So, if we look at into um, their objectives of the N NLCDP, um, there are five objectives. So the first is to identify the needs of community, uh, to promote communicate, uh, uh, interaction among residents, to cultivate we feeling among residents, to develop leadership, to involve residents in lounging activities for the neighborhood, okay? So you see that all the five uh, objectives were actually, you know, uh, if we look, if we, if we stand in 2022 today, you'll find that a lot of the community groups that emerge uh, in between actually increasingly can uh, meet these objectives, okay? Um, so the, the we feeling among residents or the interactions uh, throughout all these movements, you know, uh, in these 40 years have been actually been fulfilled, but in another way. Um, so this is quite ironic, but in this report, um, the government officer, the district, um, the city district officer um, um, who was writing this report um, had actually some um, positive evaluation of the program as well as some critical comments. So if you read through it, you'll find that those comments are not just, um, they were not casual, trivial comments. They were really, you know, the, the government official really want to see how they can improve the program. Um, so, for example, um, the officer said that the project should operate in collaboration with rather than in parallel with the existing local indigenous leadership organizations uh, and that Caritas was the uh, provider of the service should 
formulate its program in the overall context of the Salgay One Hill site and not just the project area in isolation. Okay, so this report was about how Caritas Mengoi was providing NLCDP programs to uh, a, a Salgay One community. So both positive and critical comments and um, the final interesting part is that the name of the officer is actually Matthew Zhang Ginzhong. Uh, and at that time, he was um, his position was the assistant district officer in the Eastern District. So as we all know, Matthew Zhang was the um, uh, was was the outgoing um, uh, chief secretary uh, of the previous administration. Um, but this shows that the, how at that time, the colonial administration were really intending to use the NLCDP as an instrument to to penetrate themselves into the you know in, into the grassroots communities and try to reconnect with the grassroots. So in this context, um, community activism um, uh, they incarnate in the form of welfare advocacy for marginalized um, populations. So as I mentioned, uh, the provision of welfare service by different voluntary associations and religious organizations, um, there were um, um, a lot of protests which are not reported, not really um, reported in the media. Some of the high, more high profile ones were reported. Um, including the uh, most well-known, the Yao Ma Dei, um, boat dweller protest, Tang Wu. Uh, for example, here you see that this is, um, I think, publication by um, HKFS, Hong Kong Federation of Students, um, and uh, about the their, their you know, the involvement, uh, the activist involvement in helping the boat dwellers who live on, on the shore of Yao Ma Dei. So you, you can see that the coalition actually involves the student unions, the student activists, um, um, you know, the uh, uh, mutual aid committees, uh, and also the social workers, okay, and their uh, organizations. Um, we also see a lot of the public housing protests, you know, especially the squatter houses. One of the most famous incident was the on lock chun sigin, which, um, um, there are not a lot of public writings about it, but it's in Funlang. Okay, so it was a, a group of student activists, uh, uh, HKFS, the Hong Kong Federation of Students included, in helping you know people who live in squatter houses because they were soon to be demolished and moved to uh, public uh, uh, housing. Um, and then fast forward to the early 1990s, there were uh, a, a, a wave of the rooftop house protests, Tin Toil. Uh, um, uh, um, which went pretty confrontational. So the major actors in this wave were the student activists, were the left-wing activists, as well as the social workers. Uh, repertoire, um, you know, peaceful sit-in, rally, but at that time, the colonial government um, would arrest those activists in, in, on the grounds of illegal assembly. So uh, a, a, quite a, a number of social workers were, were arrested. Um, and so this kind of community activism amounts to uh, a form of advocacy or pressure politics under the administrative uh, absorption of politics, okay? Um, and um, in the 1980s, however, we saw a decline of this, um, the, the wave one community activism. Um, so there are three factors contributing to this decline. Uh, number one is that um, the, uh, when elections, there were more uh, popular uh, elections, popular votes, the rise of electoral politics basically divert the resources and people's attention from the communities, from community activism into elections. So, uh, so with the suffrage of district council, urban council, and later the LECHCO, uh, a lot of the activists, they were, you know, driven into the electoral arena. For example, we see uh, Frederick Fong, Fong Kim Gay. Um, he uh, started his career as a community activist, but very soon he stepped into the uh, electoral realm um, and, um, and, and, well, became a district councillor and later a electrical member ever since. So uh, previous scholars have already argued that how this... Um, rise of electoral politics sucked the energy away from community 
activism, because there is a it, it, it's a conflict uh, between community politics and electoral politics, because in community politics, uh, it's basically through protests, confrontations, non-compromise with the government, whereas in the electoral politics, you have to be moderate, you have to focus your energy into in, in elections. So um, hence, when the uh, ele electoral politics uh, uh, were, were developing, it kind of shrank the uh, interest and uh, the, the energy in, in community activism. Another wave was the, uh, another factor was uh, the domination of Hanover uh, negotiations, um, uh, which I'm not gonna talk about in further. Uh, people's interests start to be more interested in uh, what will happen after the 1997 Hanover. Um, the third factor was had to do with the later development of um, the community activism. As I earlier mentioned, um, the early 1990s had a few of these very confrontational protests led by social workers. So this led the government to rethink the policy of NLCDP. So eventually the colonial administration decided to reform the NLCDP in 1995, and they further professionalized the social workers and also introduced the lump sum grant system um, in 2000 under the leadership of uh, Carrie Lam uh, at that time. Um, so basically community activism had withered by the time of the Hanover um, rather prematurely. Okay, so the second wave of um, community activism took place between 2005 uh, and the early 2010s. Um, so this wave of activism was a legacy of the 2003-2004 anti-government demonstrations or where a massive number of uh, amount of people uh, uh, flooded the street to protest against the Tong Hua government and also Article 23. Um, but they also groomed a new, um, new group of activists Activists and young activists uh, uh, who uh, were, you know, more post-material. Um, they are net less ideological, although they are also left-leaning. But they they don't talk about Marx. They don't talk about socialism. But they they are more emphasizing on the, um, you know, the the the, the dominance of, uh, of 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 tycoons and capitalists and and big companies in Hong Kong. Okay, so. Uh, in this context, there were a series of heritage preservation movements, um, and there were anti-development uh, uh, protests led by these activists, um, using much more direct and confrontational actions, and they were increasingly reliant on, um, on the internet and social media. Uh, and the, the objectives of these activists were to challenge uh, the neoliberal developmentalist uh, agenda of the government and also uh, what the people at that time called the real estate hegemony. There was a you know, very famous book uh, published called the Daytime Bakun at that time. It was a, it was a master frame of social movements. Um, and on the other hand, there were also growing dissatisfaction with the among these activists, these young activists uh, with the traditional uh, opposition parties. Uh, so these activists who started these uh, these activism, these protests, they they came from, they participated in 2003 and 2004, but not as organizers. They were participants, but they were inspired by it. They and they they were not very happy that um, concerns uh, about democracy at the time was only about the electoral politics, was only about winning seats at the LegCo at the district council. They want to take the they want to expand the notion of democracy further to incorporate uh, the notion of economic and social well-being. So developmentalism became um, a, a target for them. Um, so under this in, in this context, the community activism that emerged um, was um, activism against neoliberal uh, developmentalism. So we saw several issue-driven mobilizations. Uh, starting with the uh, Lidong Street uh, preservation campaign in 2005, 2006. It's actually spanned quite a long time, two to three years, uh, with the establishment of a, a concern group called H15, which uh, lobbied the government to uh, have an alternative plan to redevelop the area. Uh, 
And then in 2006, there was Star Ferry uh, Preservation Movement, Star Ferry Pier Preservation Movement, actually. Um, and the uh, Queen's Pier Preservation Movement. Uh, and finally, uh, just before, shortly before the anti-express uh, railing movement, uh, um, there was a preservation campaign in Choyun uh, village. And all of these campaigns were led by um, young post-material activists and also concerned citizens. So they are no longer just about, um, about the activists and the marginalized population. So this drew in much more of the you know, uh, citizens who are interested in social movement. At that time, I was a uh, I was working uh, as a uh, as an intern at an investment bank in Hong Kong, and every Friday uh, I will go down to you know check out what's happening in Queens Pier because uh, because of you know these 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 activists. So when I was there, you see a, a group. There were a group of bystanders who are obviously not trying to participate, but they were really interested in what's going on. So much more concerned citizens were drawn in. Um, partly because of the, 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 the repertoire they were using. They were using direct actions, very performative, very theatrical. Um, I remember um, when, uh, you know, the final days of the Queen's Pier uh, campaign, uh, the activists basically used this uh, plastic, um, you know, this, this thing to, to tie themselves to the, um, to the row signs, okay? And, it, and the police had to use the, Caesars to cut them, you know, almost, you know, very near the, the, the neck. And it was very, very theatrical. So uh, all these, you know, repertoire drew a lot of attention. Um, of course, here you see that this Fu Hang, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you will remember that. Uh, confrontational, but no violence. So very peaceful, but confrontational, disruptive, direct actions. Um, I think the commonality of all these uh, the community activism is that they were, none of them were successful. They were mostly un uh, unsuccessful in blocking the developmentalist plans, um, but they did lead to a lot of changes, you know, into um, um, uh, greater consciousness in uh, heritage preservations. Especially nowadays, you know, uh, in in the past ten years, we we saw the preservation of uh, a very old cinema, the Empire Cinema, um, the you know, Geng uh, Lei, for instance. Uh, uh, so a number of heritage, so the, the consciousness about heritage identity uh, increased because of these um, because of these community activism. Um, but along with that, I also want to mention some trends that are, you know, that doesn't happen on the street, but also in the in the online space. So around 2008, 2009, that was a time when Facebook became popular in Hong Kong. So um, if you look at that time, there were a lot of community based uh, Facebook groups uh, emerging. Uh, so all these groups. So you see that this Saiwan Bimansi is one of the earliest community-based uh, discussion group uh, that was created in 2009. And this Daibo group, this is, these are the earliest, even earlier. Um, um, so March 2009, okay? So you, you see that they, they are a public group with a large number of members. Not necessarily people live in these districts, but uh, sometimes are, are from other districts, you know, like, like me, for example, I subscribe in all these groups. Um, and uh, you, you see this uh, is a private group called Tun Moon Gonglo Saktae about traffic jams in Tun Moon, which is a serious problem, uh, concern, a common interest that unite all Tun Moon residents. It was set up in 2011. And even though it's a private group, you can see it, it has a, a large number of members, okay? Um, so this is a... a, a not these are not political groups okay people do talk about politics but that's they're not about politics so sometimes about what's happening in that district what are good to eat you know some or some people have uh, extra items and they want to exchange so they're, they're they're social groups basically um but nevertheless they're they're important because i think they these are the first um I mean, in, in my memory, this is the first time when people can talk about their community in a, in, in, in a virtual space. It creates kind of a public sphere for a common interest with, uh, about a community. Um, but in early 2010s, this second wave of community activism started to decline. 
um, because the all these um, heritage preservation or anti-development uh, movements, uh, they were all issue or crisis driven. So whenever there is a, a, such a crisis, they will, these activists will mobilize, they will go to that community, they will set up concern groups, they will convene like um, a, a press conference, uh, and then they will start like, uh, like activism. But the scale of participation remains rather limited. Okay, so uh, even in the uh, during the anti uh, express rail uh, movement, um, it wasn't a, such a big protest. So every Friday, activists and citizens will like occupy the area outside the Lechko. But uh, I remember at that time the most attended rally or protest was about ten thousand people. The scale of participation couldn't match those in. Um, 2003, 2004, it could have matched those, the, the later ones that we see in 2012 or 2014 or 2019. They were very, very limited in terms of scale participation. There's also a lack of connection to other unaffected communities. So it's always about, it's always about the, the, the affected communities, but hard to make a linkage to um, other people's everyday life. But I would say the most important reason why um, the interest in community activism started to dry out was because the rise of localism, the increasing dominance of uh, identity politics. Uh, so starting from 2012, there were a lot of uh, the uh, uh, concern, a lot of controversy related, related to mainland tourists, um, to uh, parallel traders, to pregnant women coming to Hong Kong. Uh, for example, here, this is the DNG protests, uh, one of the first anti-tourist, uh, anti-mainlandization protests, um, because at that time, DNG, uh, there was a, like, a, a, like a little saga when a, 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 a Hong Konger tried to take a picture at, uh, of, of DNG, uh, he was not allowed. And then, um, and then that, that caused a, a public outcry, and there was a protest happening outside of it. So this development, these localist um, uh, identity politics, again, suck away the energy from community activism. Um, so it wasn't until the, th you know, the, the protests in um, the, the protests in 2012, 2014, created, generated another new um, wave of community activism, but with a, with a different focus again. So the third wave of community activism, um, they developed in parallel or uh, following the major pro-democracy or pro-autonomy movements. Uh, I would call them pro-autonomy more because I think pro-democracy is the generic term that describe a lot of protests in Hong Kong, but the focus on these are uh, you know, more autonomy in terms of you know, el elections and, and, and uh, et cetera. Uh, for example, the anti-national education movement in 2012 uh, and the umbrella movement in 2014. So this wave of community activism is very colorful. It, um, it, it, it encompasses a lot of new co uh, community groups uh, with different aims. Some of them are overtly political, their interest in elections. Some of them are their interest in politics, but they do not participate in election, but they would like to promote uh, democracy objectives. Others are just cultural. They don't talk about politics, um, even though you know people who join them might be interested in politics. But I think the in most interesting part uh, development in this period is that these groups start to identify themselves by the communities they were based in. So they start to call themselves uh, in the 18 districts or even, you know, smaller communities within the districts, they're trying to identify themselves with those, uh, with those labels. And I think this is something entirely new in Hong Kong. Um, it, well, as a bottom-up initiative. Um, so I would characterize this wave of community activism as the extension of the pro-democracy or uh, pro-democracy movement. They're trying to extend into the, into the communities. Um, so um, I think the common theme, um, at least that uh, shared by the po more politically oriented community groups, 
is that they tr they are trying to counter the pork barrel politics well in 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 Chinese the Sezai Bangjong politics right um, the the clientelist patronage politics that were promoted by the pro-establishment camp so the pro-democracy activists they want to create a different sort of um, um, community engagement they are not based on single exchanges of goods and services, but a more long-term engagement um, through which they could promote um, or preach their um, democracy um, um, uh, ideals, uh, visions. So, um, so these groups en uh, encompass the election-oriented groups, um, those that are intended to run in the district council election or the LegCo election, uh, the mutual help groups that don't that didn't intend to contest in elections, but they wanted to promote uh, pro democracy ideals. The advocacy groups focusing much more on policy advocacy, engagement with the government, and the cultural groups that are uh, they don't talk about politics a lot, but they are interested in historicizing their interest in digging up the interesting things or the historical. Uh, parts about their their own communities. Um, the actors um, the actors broadened again. So not only the pro democracy activists, but a lot of what I call I think that they're called citizen activists. They are homegrown native activists. Well, citizens who live in their districts, who live in their communities, but they aspire to be uh, an activist. They aspire to be elected politicians or some people would call them political novice, so young. Um, the repertoire, again, is very um, diverse um, through services, um, not exactly the same as the pro-establishment camp, but nevertheless, some similarities, but uh, of a more long-term engagement level because the activists, they didn't have a lot of resources, so they can only rely on more you know, idealistic um, or, or long-term engagement um, in, in, a, in, a, in a method that I would call democratic preaching. Uh, in, in some of the examples that I'll illustrate, you'll see how they try to preach the ideals of um, uh, democracy by knocking on people's door and by going into the, uh, and providing some sort of service and then telling them about the importance of democracy and also voting for pro-democracy candidates. Uh, and also election uh, campaigning. Um, so this is actually a search that I did on Facebook uh, around 2016 and 17. So I was trying to snowball uh, and see the landscape of Hong Kong's civil society, because at that time, a lot of these civil society and community groups, they would uh, they were set up, but they would also maintain an online presence. So you will see the landscape very clearly. If you do snowball, you see which uh, group follow which group. Um, so basically this encompasses most of the pro-democracy or they're in the, uh, let's put it that way, they're the non-pro-establishment civil society. Um, not necessarily pro-democracy. Not, not every one of them are explicitly pro-democracy, but they are, um, they're, they're in a, you know, in their own public sphere. So uh, you see that between, so this is a, the um, uh, the state of affairs before 2012, the number of known uh, uh, civil society groups. Um, and this is what, what uh, was the case between 2012 and 2014. So uh, a rapid growth of online community groups, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, and a lot of new SMOs, uh, social movement organization, NGOs uh, establishing. And after 2014, there were again a, another surge of, in terms of the number of groups, but this is much more focused on the community groups, including the election oriented groups, as well as the mutual aid groups. So the online community groups are still growing, but not as much. So they grow most rapidly here because of the popularity of Facebook at, the, at, at that time. Um, in the, in the, after 2014, there were more of the professional civic groups like, uh, you know, um, the, the League Fa Zeng Wei Si, for instance, uh, um, these kind of groups. 
Okay, so I'm not going further into what all these groups do, but I'm just going to provide you with a uh, impression. The election oriented groups, you can see that, uh, well, all of them are defunct by now. They have been disbanded after 2009, uh, 2020. Um, but you can see that they all try to identify themselves with their own community or their own district, eyeing on the uh, district council elections. Um, and they were most active in between 2014 and 2019. Um, and then um, the other kind are the mutual help and the advocacy groups. Um, and uh, let's look at an example. So this is a, a group that I followed for, uh, for some years uh, called Fixing Hong Kong. It still exists. Um, so they were doing, uh, so in, in Chinese, they are Wai Sao Hong Kong. It was a group that was established um, during the, actually during the umbrella movement by a group of um, people who stayed in the occupied zones. And they, they at that time, the realization was that, oh, uh, actually, if people occupy the streets for so long, the citizens would feel unhappy about it because they feel that their life would be disrupted. So what to do about it? So their solution is that they should go back to the community and to explain to people about the importance of uh, fighting for democracy, even through more disruptive means. So they decided to choose, they actually, there was a conscious process of choosing which neighborhood to be based on. So they choose uh, Tou Gua Wan um, at that time because they thought it was a poor neighborhood with a lot of ethnic minorities, with um, a lot of you know, uh, redevelopment issues, uh, pretty much like the squatter housing you know, in the past. You know, in, in Togawan, there are a lot of the Tongfong, the subdivided flats. So Wai Sao Hong Kong, Fixing Hong Kong, decided to partner with NGOs there and then to visit people's home, agreeing to fix the appliances and furnitures for them so that they can preach about democracy when they enter their homes. Um, so, these groups don't run, uh, th this group fixing Hong Kong, they don't run for election, but they do actively persuade people to vote for pro-democracy candidates. Uh, and it's still, it's still functioning, still, uh, still, still going on for now, um, uh, partly because of the fact that they don't, don't involve themselves in, in elections. Um, the, the fourth type of groups are the cultural groups that I mentioned that do not overtly involve in politics, but they write about the cultural aspects of their communities. Uh, they um, in manifest in the form of both, of both on, offline and online. So they do physical printed publications, and they also uh, run pages. For example, this is Ji Sao Gei, this is a, uh, about Shao Kei Wan. Um, and this is uh, Apple Chow, where I live. Um, and there was a group about uh, the changes in Apple Chow. They, uh, it's a group that were run by local citizen activists. They were not involved in politics, but they have an interest because they live in Apple Chow. Some of them grow up in Apple Chow and they, they love this place. And they want to create a sense of community by posting anything that is about or old pictures or history. Uh, uh, about about their community. Well, this third wave, of course, as we know, have declined after 2019 uh, under the changing political development uh, under the NSL as well as the pandemic. Um, so uh, from 2019 onwards, we see the uh, disbanding of many political organizations that everybody knows by now, and also the community groups, especially the election-oriented uh, community groups that I just mentioned. Uh, and the ecology of community activism uh, also changed rapidly because uh, a lot of pro-democracy district councilors got elected in 2019, but afterwards, they uh, many of them resigned. And now there is a hollow state in, in the district, um, in terms of the you know, district uh, councils. Um, so, 2019 onwards, it's a new, um, it's 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 a blank slate in a in a in a sense. It's a blank blank slate in a sense because a lot of things that we found in a previous wave are kind of e evaporated. 
But 2019, the movement itself also created new forms of community activism. Uh, uh, yellow economy uh, that many people have written about, I'm not going to talk about, but I, what I want to uh, mention briefly um, is the community newspapers. And it's actually a research that I've been uh, uh, doing for some time. Um, originally, I want, really want to focus on the community newspapers, but it's still ongoing research, so I decided to give you guys a background about community activism first. So these community act, uh, newspapers, they were like the cultural groups we see in way three, but they chose a very conventional way of engagement. They, they use printed media. They publish newspapers, which in Hong Kong, you rarely see people holding a newspaper and read it nowadays, but they, they do it the old way. Uh, and in these newspapers, they try to reimagine the community they try to historicize their district. Um, interestingly, they will adopt uh, the historical construct of that district. It's also not organic. Okay, so for example, uh, I, uh, uh, before um, oh, I, I, two weeks ago, I interviewed uh, 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 the newspaper in Kuai Ting, right? And I asked, well, why do you choose Kuai Ting as a construct? And they, you know, they just say, oh, because Kuai Ting is a district, and because Kuai Ting actually, uh, actually encompasses Ting Yi and Kuai Chong and uh, Kuai Sing. It's a very large area and very different live, life experience. Um, so, and, 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 and it's just so interesting that they decided to adopt this, uh, this official construct of the, the administrative boundary of, uh, by, you know, uh, left down by the colonial administration to build this community. OK, but in any case, I will argue that these community newspapers, they're trying to build a kind of sub identity, you know, it's under the Hong Kong identity. How do people identify with their local community? And also through the newspaper, they try to establish some kind of local networks with the uh, with the shops, with the NGOs, etc., or with the with the, with the residents. Um, so the landscape of community uh, community newspapers, they're just amazing. You know, you will find basically in each district, you will be able to find one newspaper. Uh, some of these are already defunct um, for various reasons, um, because maybe those, some people have emigrated, maybe they ran out of resources, but a lot of these newspapers are actually still going on until today. Um, and very interestingly, uh, some, many of these newspapers, um, the reason why they were formed was because um, during 2019, a lot of community what's, uh, uh, telegram groups were built, okay? And it was during that time that people proposed the idea of uh, establishing newspapers uh, so that people can be more concerned about their own community. And that's how a lot of these newspapers were actually originated. They are originated from community telegram groups. Um, so here we see the kind of a connection with the um, with these online community groups starting from 2009, when um, when people start to be able to talk about their community in the online space, but not in the physical space still, but in the online space. Um, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, if you're interested in what these uh, newspapers are doing, um, uh, there are actually, there's a website uh, you can go on in media. They host a website that has the PDF version of all of these community newspapers. Um, this is a newspaper based in Dai Gok Zoi called Gok Seng, uh, TKT Awakening. Um, and you see that they were very concerned about um, the, the development of their district how urban planning will affect uh, people's life in their community. Uh, this is a, a page of, I think, Wong uh, Dai uh, Xin. It's called Sun Xin Chut Lo, right? They, they have this very interesting word play and uh, talk about trees, okay? This page talk about trees. And I want to also show you, you know, they also have uh, advertisements uh, of restaurants and they have coupons for people to go to restaurants as well. Um, okay, so the conclusion is that um, 
uh, I, as I argue in this presentation, eventful protests in Hong Kong were a major driver of community activism. Uh, they lead uh, citizens to be more um, uh, concerned about local communities as a domain for participation and also self-identification. And they also, these protests also provide the actors, the frames, the issue concerns that influence the subsequent wave of community activism. Um, so my findings here, at what, which I intend to carry forward was to provide a much more nuanced understanding of social activism in Hong Kong, because uh, all the time we're more concerned is with what's happening in big protests, major mass mobilization, but uh, what's happening at the community level, the activism at the community level, which are not very confrontational, but they are still important. Uh, and I think this uh, can make a good contribution to our understanding about movement consequences, social movement consequences, that movements doesn't necessarily lead to policy changes, um, but at the same time, it can lead to other changes that are more subtle and more nuanced. Uh, 